A warrior is not a person that carries a gun. The biggest war you ever go through is right between your own ears. It's in your mind. We're all going through a war in our mind and we have to callous our mind to fight that war and, and to win that war. So one example I can give you about callous in your mind about doing things that make you uncomfortable. There's a, there, there's a book out there called Lone Survivor and there's a guy named Marcus Luttrell. He was on an operation where a bunch of guys died and I knew all the guys that died. And I, knew Mark, and, and, and I know Marcus Luttrell very well. This story touched my heart. And I basically went out there, found a foundation to raise money for it. Called the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. You give 100% tuition for, let's say your dad died in the war. He was a special operator. If that guy had a kid, you would get 100% tuition to go to college. Great foundation. Great people working at the foundation. I'm going to do this. So I Googled the 10 hardest races in the world. And at this time in my life, I was not a runner. I maybe ran 10 miles the whole year. I was into bodybuilding. I was into weight training. And that's what I did. So I Googled the 10 hardest races in the world. And what came up, number one, was this race called the Badwater 135. It's a 135 mile race through Death Valley in the summertime. So I wanted to get in this race. I thought it was actually a stage race. I thought it was a race where you ran like 20 miles, set up a camp, and then ran 20 miles the next day. I didn't know people ran 100 miles, 135 miles at one time. You know, I, I, I know it was even possible. I, I had never even run a marathon. So I called the race director up. His name was Chris Kosman, And I called him up on a Wednesday. And, he, and this is in November. He said, David, to qualify for my race, you have to do 100 miles. And I said, 100 miles in a calendar year? I didn't know what was going on. He said, no, 100 miles in 24 hours or less. And I thought that was humanly impossible. He said, so you got to do that in 24 hours or less for me to consider you in my race. He goes, there's a race on Saturday. And I called him up on Wednesday. It was that four days for me to get ready for this race. And I had run 10 miles a whole year. And so he said, if you qualify, if, if you do 100 miles, 24 hours or less, I might consider you in my race. So four days later, I'm out there in San Diego. And the, and the race was called the San Diego One Day, where you run around a 24 or, or around a one mile track for 24 hours to see how many miles you can get. And so I go out there. Did, I didn't know what I was doing. I had mild plates and rich crackers. And I had a blue lawn chair. That's all I had. And I was going to see my crew person every single mile. And I was going to drink mild plex and have a rich cracker. They had no water, I had nothing. Went out there, got to mile 20 wasn't feeling too bad. Around mile 30, I started feeling my, sh my, my shins starting to get extremely sore. And I started to develop stress fractures, shin splints. I started feeling the metatarsals in my feet starting to break at around mile 50. By mile 70, I was totally destroyed. And I sat down in this blue lawn chair and I was destroyed. And, and, and when a bigger person sits down, I don't know exactly how much I weighed, but I was extremely, I was extremely big. I was a power lifter, lifted a lot of weights, and I was not an endurance athlete by any means. So I sat down in this blue lawn chair, looked at my crew person, and I literally couldn't stand up. I was destroyed, and I couldn't go to the bathroom. I had, I, well, I couldn't stand up to go to the bathroom. So I sat there, and I went to the bathroom myself. I was destroyed, and I was turning, I was discolored, I was pale, I was dizzy, lightheaded. I was in the worst shape of my entire life. I'd been in three hell weeks, ranger school, all these different training programs. And this was the worst situation I'd been in my entire life. I thought I was literally dying. And all I could think about was how can I get out of this chair? I have 30 miles to go. And everything I had gone through, I realized that the human mind, if you can put it in a very quiet, calm place, and get it to calm down and not be so spastic that you could possibly make this work out for you. How bad, how bad are you really? If you are. I had a teacher in eighth grade. Eighth grade tell me I wasn't gonna make it in high school. Eighth grade I had a teacher telling me that foolishness. And what did I do? I proved them right. I went to high school while and out. Ninth grade year, wild out so bad, that school kicked me out. They was like, you know, we can't even take this no more. Kick you out. Go to another school. I completely flunked that. 
go to a third school and finally begin to get my act together. I've proven everybody who did not believe in me right, and the few people who did believe in me, I've proven them wrong. Again, we dealing with it matters of the heart now. A lot of times we behave in the way we behave because we don't feel like we got worth or value. We don't really recognize the heritage of who we are and what we can do. So we just on that, I'm just going to do whatever and get a couple laughs. But when you recognize how great you are, when you recognize that champion that's inside you, you'll say, you know what, I got more to give. There's more to life than this right here. I deserve better. You deserve better. And then you'll say, you know what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to prove everybody who didn't believe in me wrong. And the few people who do believe in me, I'm going to prove them right. And when you do that, everything inside your life changes. I just start saying, before I make decisions, I just start saying, okay, is this going to make my mama proud or all the people that's hating on me? Is this going to make them say, see, I told you. I'm in India speaking. I found out the culture in India, there in Bangalore where I was, has the highest suicide rate. Because if these kids do not do well in high school, they know they won't go to college and they know for the rest of their life they'll end up in poverty. And they said, I'd rather die than be in poverty. That's what you call desperation. But you're going to settle for whatever the world gives you? You're going to settle for living how your mom and dad live now? I'm telling y'all, my young friends, you ain't got to settle for that. Most people think that the people that are at a very high level in society are cut from a different cloth. They think that they're, they're, they're literally a different breed than them and that, they're, and that they can't get those things. So that's kind of interesting, right? And uh, it's always kind of a shocker to, to have the, uh, the, the myth of that person burst. But see, here's the thing. Although we're not cut from a different cloth, the fact that I mastered consistency is the difference. And most people will never do that. No one wants you to succeed, right? Only your mom. And even your mom doesn't want you to succeed because she's afraid you're not going to call her back. Your brain doesn't want you to be a big success. Your brain just wants to keep you alive. All your brain wants you to do is just pump out one or two kids so the DNA can continue on. That's it. Your brain will trick you. You are your own worst enemy. I know that if I fail to do that, that I am not instilling those habits that's going to have, that's going to have a big picture, long-term goal. Dudes, talent is overrated, homie. There's no price too great for me. There's, there's nothing too great. I would die for, for my dreams. You know what I'm saying? I'm willing to risk it. Uh, there's, there's nothing too great. There's no amount that I'm, that I'm not willing to go.